begin the class session. Uh, first of all, subscribe to our channel. Uh, what I want to say to the YouTube audience is to please subscribe and click or uh, whatever it is that you do on the like. Thumbs up so that we can get uh, more uh, exposure, hopefully. Subscribe to the John Ray channel. <laughs> to click on thumbs up, I like. Good morning. He said, Good morning. Thank you. Um, we left off. We're, we're one lesson behind. I think you all won't remember that from last week. Uh, we did. We finished lesson eight in this quarter last week, uh, and we have lesson nine if we start where we left off. And I want to do that. Uh, so I want to try to do nine and ten, or at least a portion of ten uh, today. Uh, because then the next week, the lesson is rather short. The scripture, the study text. It's only 19 verses or something like that. So uh, ho hopefully we can catch up by the end of, of next week. But today I would like you to, um, if you have your little books with you, open up to page 41. And look at the batch of study texts that there are for us. Uh, the first one is Numbers, um, which uh, and I got my little chart of books so you can see how far down Numbers is. This is the fourth book from the very beginning of the Bible. Uh, the title of the lesson is Pornography is destructive. <clears throat> I do not remember such a lesson seven years ago in the seven year cycle. So, uh, I but again, uh, as I said last week, I would have called it something different if it was left up to me. Uh, uh, because the scripture lessons or the study text it, uh, are more about morality than, than pornography. Uh, but be it as it may, today's lesson is pornography is destructive. Uh, and we had a personal testimony last week and uh, Richard said that he had been addicted to it uh, for, uh, I think he said, seven and a half years. Um, and that it uh, was destructive to him. But he got over it, repented of it no more. And he made some, some of these kind of gestures. No more. And we can rejoice and be glad for that, for him. Verse, we're starting with, uh, in Numbers chapter 15 today. Uh, and just uh, four verses, verses 37 through 40. And this, of course, is part of the law that Moses wrote. And it said, says in verse 37 that the Lord spake unto Moses and here's what he said he said speak unto the children of Israel and bid them that they make them fringes 
in the borders of their garments. Not just once. See, the King John version is adding stuff here. He says, not just once, but throughout their generations. And that they put upon the friends of the borders a ribbon of blue. And it shall be unto you for a friend, that you may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them. And that ye seek not after your own heart and your own eyes, after which your own heart and your own eyes will you use them to go a whoring, it says. Verse 40, that you may remember and do all my commandments and be holy unto your God. Uh, that he just he just kind of repeating himself there when he says that God is. Uh, but it seems like to me that if, when God says it once, it's really all God needs to say it. But here it's more than once. Does anybody have any questions on this? A segment of, of scripture before we move to the next one. The next study text is. In Do you think the blue represents the sky, like God in heaven? Kind of? I have no idea why he chose the cover color blue, except it's my favorite color. That's, that's it. Uh, he must have had me in mind. That's what I was kind of thinking. It was represented the sky as where God is in heaven, that kind of thing. I don't know. Uh, except today the sky wasn't so blue when we came in. Well, I left my house. It didn't come in today. So today it's not holy? It was all foggy. <laughs> today it's not holy in, in the sky. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I, I, again, I say I have no idea why he... Um, uh, so you know that's uh, been associated with uh, Israel, blue. Well, it is in terms of their uh, national flag now. Their flag is, is basically white, but with a couple of blue stripes across it and with the Star of David in the middle of it. Uh, and all of that is in blue. So you're correct in that regard. Any other thoughts? Then the next study text is in 2 Samuel, which is, in my book, it's um, 180 pages to the right. You get to 2 Samuel, uh, chapter 11. And just, again, uh, in chapter 11, four verses, verse 2 through 5. Verse 2 says, And it came to pass in an evening tide, and I, I think you all are familiar, you probably heard this story a bunch of times if you've been in church for very long. It came to pass in an evening tide that David arose, that's King David, arose from off his bed, and he walked upon the roof of the king's house, the king being David. So he went up on top of his own house and walked on the roof. It caused us an evening tide. I don't know exactly um, what time of day that would have been, but it was light enough that from the roof where he was, he saw a woman washing herself, and he saw that the woman was very beautiful, beautiful to look upon. I do not know how far away her house was. I doubt that he had binoculars in those days. But 
the, the scripture that we just read in Numbers is to not follow after your own eyes or your own heart. But David did. So verse 3 says, David sent and he inquired after this woman. And one said, one of his people said, is not this now for a hundred years or however old I am I've heard this name pronounced Bathsheba but the uh, accent marks and the punctuation helps in my Bible it's pronounced Bathsheba. The emphasis is on bath, not she. So Bathsheba. So David sent and he inquired after the woman and then and he was told this is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam. And she's married. She's the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Now, uh, on our little map over here, you can't really see, but the Hittites were from way up here, north of, of even of, of, of Lebanon, into the land of Turkey, uh, what we would call Turkey today. That's where the Hittites were from. I don't know why... Uh, a Hittite was down here in Jerusalem and had married this lady, but it's just another uh, indication of people uh, intermarrying against the um, the wishes of our Creator. It ends with a question mark. Isn't this the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite? So David sent messengers and he took her, or they took her, the messengers did, they took her, and she came to his palace, to his uh, house, the king's house, and she came in unto him, and he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness. Now, what that's referring to is what we uh, quietly refer to as her time of the month. Okay? She had been purified from her time of the month. And she returned after laying with David unto her own house. And later, verse 5, again, the King John Version here is adding a little bit of stuff, but, and later the woman realized she had conceived. Bathsheba had conceived. So she sent a messenger and told David and said, I am with child. I'll never that, be able to say Bathsheba. Excuse me? I'll never be able to say Bathsheba. Okay. <laughs> That's all right. I just right. said it twice. <laughs> That's all right. It's okay. It's okay. You call her Bathsheba all you want. It's, it's okay. Just like Jesus. I can't say Yeshua. Yeah, uh, that's that's just all it is is an illustration of what we the first study text that we read in the book of Numbers: to not follow your eyes and your heart, but to keep His commandments. Don't be looking at the naked girl bathing on the roof. That's pornography. That's uh, uh, 
one of the uh, probably the eleventh commandment. Yeah, that's but that's pornography during that time. That's right. Yeah, he should have not looked at her. Well, just keep yourself busy being the king, and then you won't have time to cavort. Huh? Pornography, the word is just a, a word for, <clears throat> it's a Greek word, and it's porno comes from uh, sexual immorality. That's what it is. Yeah. So it's any kind of sexual immorality. And, and what I'm telling you, uh, what I have said, is that today's lesson, these scripture texts are more about morality than they are anything else. But this uh, was most certainly on that sexual immorality. This case. Oh, no, no yeah. question. Yeah, no this question. was sexual. No question. You know, if he would have. Just looking at her wasn't. What? Just looking at her wasn't. Yeah, no, looking at her was. It's was the wrong. action. I guess it's the activity. But the well, see, it the led road. to it. See, that's why. It's a slippery slope. Once you start looking at naked girls, you're going to want to go have sex with them. And that's essentially the point of this. If he wouldn't have looked on her with lust, he probably wouldn't have took it farther. You know? she was a I think there's too probably be. lots of guys that would have seen her and they, they Yeah, but if she had her. more roles than curves, he probably wouldn't have went after her. Well, you know, she didn't if, have more roles. If what? <laughs> That's what I'm saying. <laughs> well, beauty back then was different. They might like the big girls. So was it her fault? <laughs> well, yeah, it was her ended fault. up on the roof. Don't you think? What? I know, that's why I was going to She started it. She could have waited another hour until it got darker. He went on the roof. It's his roof. It's her bath. In oh the my. open. Shame on her. Men always blame it on the women. Be on I'm, not on the I'm not blaming it on the woman. I'm not blaming it on the woman. It's just they were both in the wrong. And they need, they, they need not do that. Only when they took the action. The no. action was unrobing in public. Well, well, oh, you're right. They didn't take a bath. You're I right in it. a sense that it. I mean that it. It's not really sin, but that's how sin is conceived. That's how it starts. It's how well, it starts. Well, it's not uh, sin until you actually do the sin. I've told you a story before, and I'm going to tell it again. Uh, that before I moved to Houston, forty uh, uh, some odd years ago. I worked in Dallas, downtown Dallas, for, for 13 years. And I worked on the 22nd floor of the Adolphus Tower, which was much higher than 22 floors. But the Adolphus Hotel is connected to the Adolphus Tower. Down on, on the first floor, you can walk into the hotel. Well, on it was only 20 stories tall, the Adolphus Hotel was. But I, I, I learned, meaning when I went to work there, I was, uh, uh, I became aware, I'll put it that way. I, I don't remember exactly how, but um, I learned that there were, ladies who uh, sunbathed on the top of the Adolphus Tower on lounge chairs um, with virtually no clothes on. And uh, it, it was all I could do to keep the guys in my department from standing over there at the window looking down. And the windows were such that there were, you know, they were, um, you couldn't, you could see out of them, but you couldn't see in them. So right. the, the girls down there didn't know there was, there was guys up there. Uh, and there might have been guys on the 21st floor and the 20th floor, maybe even the 23rd floor, I don't know. But these ladies were airline hostesses. Uh, and they, their airlines had contracts that when they had a layover in Dallas, this is where they stayed. And it was just one of the things that they knew. And, and, and I think that that's kind of the case here with Bethsheba, that uh, 
it, it, it was her house and she could go to the roof of her house if she wanted to. Uh, her husband was gone off to war. Uh, so she wasn't, uh, wasn't supervised or whatever the right word would be. Uh, and I don't know the right word. I struggle with that right word uh, in my own uh, extended family uh, because they don't seem to understand that it's my job to teach them. That it's the older generation's job to teach the younger generation. And then that generation teaches its generation. But uh, I, I've got three fine children, two boys and a girl. But they don't, they don't take any instruction from me. Uh, now, not anymore. I mean, they, they did when I was kids growing up. But uh, they're 50-something now, all of them. And, uh, and, and they don't appreciate instruction from an old guy. Uh, anyway. Our next study text is uh, here just uh, just uh, the next page or so. Uh, it's the first 13 verses in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 12. So starting with verse 1, it says, And the Lord sent Nathan unto David. Again, this is a story I think you've heard. If you've heard the Bathsheba one. Then you've heard this, that the Lord sent Nathan, who was a prophet. No teacher told him to be a prophet. God gave him the office of being a prophet. And he sent, the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and Nathan came unto him and said unto David, listen here, there were two men in one city. One of them was rich, and the other one was poor. Now the rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished up. And it grew up together with him, and it was his pet. It was with his children. It did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup. So they fed it table scraps, this little sheep. And it laid in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter. Boy, did he love that little girl sheep. Verse 4. Now there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock. Meaning the rich man, he didn't want to, even though he had a bunch of them, he had exceeding many flocks and herds, he didn't want to take one of them to dress for the wayfaring man that was come unto him. But he took the poor man's lamb, and he dressed it. I had to kill it first for the man that was come unto him. Nathan was telling this story and he stopped there. I think he was probably interrupted by David's anger. Verse 5 was greatly kindled against that rich man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold. He, he needs to give that poor man four lambs back because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, David, king, with all due respect, 
You are the man. You're the rich man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. And I gave to you Saul's house. And I gave to you Saul's wives into thy bosom. And I gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. So when you look on the map here, what God is talking about is he gave him the land all the way from here down to here in this area. Made him king over all of that. As a matter of fact, it might have been larger than that. This is a, this uh, map is not made for the purpose of, of me using it to illustrate, but I was just showing you what uh, the boundaries of Israel are today. And I gave thee, I'm back in verse 8, I gave thee thy master's house, that was Saul's house, and I gave thy master's wives, those were Saul's wives, into your bosom. David had a bunch of wives, let me tell you. Uh, he did not need Bathsheba. because he had all of these others. And I gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. He's telling him, look, see, see we know from elsewhere that uh, the, the, the scripture says that David was a man after God's own heart. Well, in that case, from God giving nothing is too much to give to a fellow like that. So he said, look, if, I, if, if, if that land that I pointed out to you on the map there had been not enough, then I would have given you such and such more. And the such and such is just, those words are just used for us, for our imagination as to what they, I don't know if those were, uh, you know, diamond rings or more land or more, more flocks or, I don't know, or more wives, I don't know. Verse 9. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? You have killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and you've taken his wife to be thy wife. Well, when was the wedding? I think uh, they they were married at the time that they laid together. You took him, you took her to be your wife. And you slain Uriah, this is at the end of verse 9, with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now, what that's saying is that there was a war going on over here between Israel and Ammon, which now is in the land of Jordan. Uh, but at the time, there was a battle going on there, and Uriah the Hittite that had come from way up here, come down here and got married, he had to somehow, somehow he got into the army. And David sent word, to, you know, I'm, I'm adding, um, there's scripture that backs this up, but David had sent word to the commanders of his army, put this fellow Uriah right up on the front line. 
in the battle. Verse 10, Now therefore, because you've done this, the sword shall never depart from thine house. You live by the sword, you die by the sword. Because thou hast despised me and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife, thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house. And he did. If you know the stories of the sons of David that wanted to be the king, well, there was more than one. Uh, Absalom was this one. He was the one that got his hair caught in a tree and hung himself. Uh, somehow it killed him. I don't, I don't know how that works exactly. But he says, I will, I will raise up evil against thee out of your own house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the daytime, in the sight of the sun. It's a son, in this case, is spelled S-U-N. Does anybody have any thoughts or comments? Uh, well, we've got a couple more verses to go here to finish this uh, section. Uh, verse 12 says, For thou didst it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the Son, meaning in the daylight. And David said unto Nathan, Oh, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, Yes, the Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. Isn't forgiveness nice? Now, we finished uh, chapter 12, verses 1 through 13. Any thoughts or comments? Yes, sir. Um, they say that uh, Bathsheba's name was mentioned only once in the Bible, and that, and that is when David asked, what is the name of that woman? My question is, in the genealogy of Matthew, but she was name was not mentioned. It, it says the wife of Uriah, even though the other woman was named. Yeah. Do you have an idea what that means? Do I have any idea what that means? That but she was I mean, not named in the genealogy of yeah, Matthew. Yeah, I think that that means her. Yeah. You didn't say that she was. She was wife. Yeah, it, it's odd that they didn't say her name. That's what you're saying, right? Yeah. They used his name. Yeah, the woman was na names were mentioned and written down. Yeah. But uh, but she was name was. Yeah, because they named Tamar and Rahab yeah, yeah. and all them, but they didn't name name use Bathsheba's yeah, name. Yeah, it's odd, you know. She wasn't very helpful. She no, was think... named the wife of Uriah, which is weird. Well, she was yeah. the, the, the wife of Uriah. Yeah, so Uriah's so, name is there, but, but she was not his. Right, because she, she sinned against him. I don't know, but it's, it's, do you have an idea what that? I don't know why. I don't know why. The name Bathsheba means, I think, daughter of the covenant or daughter of seven. So, <clears throat> kind of like the, the little ewe lamb was the daughter. So she was the daughter, that's what her name actually means in Hebrew. But so maybe they, because of the sin that they both did, maybe that's why her name wasn't used. Where Tamar and Rahab and all of them really didn't do any sin to get their name mentioned. It's, it's, it's hard to know the mind of God and why. He directed his word to be what he directed his word to be. But we don't know. 
uh, he was, in the first place, he was, this is just my opinion, it's not, there's no scripture to back this up, but uh, I don't believe that God knew what it was like to be a, a human, a person, a man, or a woman, for that matter. As he was up there and he created them down here, and he didn't know until Jesus came here and became a man. And when Jesus became became a man, things changed, and and uh, so that genealogy that you're referring to was back before Jesus came, uh, a thousand years or something like that before Jesus came, but it's in the genealogy of Jesus. The, and there's like five women spoke about in that genealogy. And three of them are not Jewish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Three of them are, one, two are Canaanites, and one's, uh, 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 what is Ruth? Ruth, uh, can't think what she is. But anyways, then there's Mary and the wife of Uriah. So that those are only two of the, Mary and her are the only two. And she's actually not really, it's really talking about Joseph, the husband of Mary <laughs> in the in the genealogy. So it's really weird the way they do it. It's, yeah. it's and the other does, thoughts does it mean that the the sin was put on Bathsheba and not on David because well, when Bathsheba did it, she could have enticed. You know, because when when we sin, God is there like a father telling you that the sin is crawling, the sin is trying to ensnare you. So God is giving you the vision, don't do it. But if you want to experience the sin, you want to do it. So is God telling Bathsheba, don't do this, don't take a bath outside because it will some, I don't know. And we just went no. through the story of Tamar too, and that's kind of interesting because you might have something there because the woman, the final was the woman's seed. So maybe that's like Uriah because David, but see that, that what they conceived in sin, that baby died. So it wasn't until the, their next baby, Solomon, was born. Mm -hmm. So the one that they actually, the baby they conceived in sin, it died. Right. Matter of fact, we went and read the next verse that says that it died. <laughs> you know, but. Yeah, he did. He did. It, it was a long, agonizing death for David. Uh, uh, it probably was for the baby as well, but. David went and poured ashes on his head and sat in the dirt and, and mourned and uh, did everything he could do to try to get his baby saved or uh, to, to live. But it didn't happen. God uh, took that child. All right, uh, let's turn. Now we're going to the New Testament, Matthew chapter 5. No, Matthew, Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 through 30. So we only, we only have four verses here to read. Um, uh, I'm starting in 27. It's a new paragraph. This is, this is of course, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And he says that ye have heard that it was said by them of old time. Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out, and cast it from thee, for it is more profitable 
for thee that one of thy members, your right eye, should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is more profitable for thee that one of thy members, the right hand, should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. Now, uh, there's uh, married men have a lot of trouble from their wives just if they gaze at some other lady for whatever uh, with no intention with no, nothing other than just seeing a person. Uh, one of the things that um, I like to do is just watch people. Uh, uh, years ago, many years ago, last time this happened was, well, no, I was going to say was, uh, more than 10 years ago, but it's not true. Uh, but, but, but back more than 10 years ago, more, more back when I had a real job and stuff like that, I used to travel a lot and I was in airports a lot. And boy, you'd see all kinds of people. Uh, all descriptions. Um, but, I'll tell you, uh, the last time that we went to the airport, when we, when we, we the car that we currently are driving, um, we bought it, we've got it roughly two and a half years ago. We, I bought it online, uh, and it was in Florida. So we made a one-way flight to Florida and then drove this car back. Well, we're sitting in the airport waiting for our flight. <laughs> and my wife says, there's Pastor Hogan. And I said, where? Now, I didn't see him. Uh, I did eventually, but I said, there's Brenda. Well, Brenda was about 40 paces in front of him. <laughs> so Dorothy was looking back there and I was looking up this other way. Now I saw I saw the lady, Brenda, and she saw the man, Robert. Anyway, shortly after that I had a uh I left a phone message on his telephone. I just called and he didn't answer, so I said that uh, I saw you at the airport on such a, no, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't put it that way. Uh, I said to him that I have spies everywhere and I know that you were at the airport on such and such a day. And anyway, he called me back and he told me that they they were going out of town to a funeral in Lubbock or somewhere. Uh, and the reason that she was so far ahead of him was that he stopped at the shoe shine stand to get his shoes shine and uh, the guy wasn't there, but Brenda went on. And he didn't stay there to get his shoes shine because of, uh, yeah, he couldn't find the guy. So uh, Brenda was ahead of him because of, because of that. And so there's all kinds of reasons for why things are the way they are, and most of them you can't explain. They just are. Any questions about 
this section in Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 through 30. Why do you all have, still have your right eyes and your right hands? <laughs> well, that's a good question. Uh, it was a, a symbol. He was using it as, a, as a, to, to try to emphasize uh, how important it was that, that you not offend God. Hyperbole. I've heard of people plucking their eyes out, though. Well, there's people that have done it. They take it literal and they do that. There's, there's people that handle snakes, too. Well, do you I think, handle them. Usually they're dead, though. Yeah. Do you think men were programmed when we were born to watch women? Sure. Yeah. And it's called the story, testosterone. Women are programmed to watch men. It's called testosterone. It's quite normal. <laughs> It's a hormone. Otherwise, there wouldn't be any kitties around. Yeah, it's a hormone. So the problem is when you're ready, the really, program is still there. Yeah. So you, you, you I said. See, men that's, really that's wouldn't like be, women the wife is unless they like had that. testosterone in their bodies. They would just like, be like. Well, the bad part is women know that, and so like they me. dress poor men to see. Well, I'm 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 guilty of 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 one time saying in this class that if if wives would take 15 minutes or so of a morning to take care of their man, then he'd be good for all day. That's. Uh, uh, it's just the way it is. Amen. Testosterone is really important. I, I got a. Uh, well, a friend of mine said her the, husband was in her 40s the test, and the sex went away. The test. So they went and had. I mean, this went on for like six years. You know, right. Couldn't figure it out. Finally, he had a blood test and his testosterone level, which I guess is unusual for a man that age, was just. She said it was so seriously low that the dis to, 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 um, you can end up having a heart attack or something. I mean, this this hormone is not only you know for the sex drive, but you know for the functioning of certain organs in your body. And it was so low that it was you know deadly low. So got him some testosterone, and of course we all know. Yeah, we know the end of the story. Every, no. Yeah, every she. Well, her words then, were, her but, words were, I was a very happy lady. <laughs> but men have been feminized so much by society that that's why you have all these. When I was a kid, there was no testosterone clinics. Now you can't drive down the road without seeing four or five of them because men have let men have been for a better word, so feminized that they are no longer men. Yeah, that's right. Well, you naturally get, it's kind of like women losing their hormones at a certain age. That, that, that is true. But now it's a money maker. So now they but, they, but they, they so can enhance But there's so many men that. that back in the 70s, when the feminist movement came on, that now men don't know how to be a man. Mine does. They say the plastics that are but, in the But he was alive. You can't he was alive like that. before the seven. I don't think you can generalize like that. No, they say the, the plastics the and the food that the they the 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 one they put in our food it lowers down testosterone, so men become more feminized than it was, before. It was the beat down of when the seventies, eighties, nineties. They're putting in your food. The plastics and the, and, the, and the mixtures that they put in our food to preserve it, preservatives. Yeah, Before, preserve there's it. nothing like that. The, the plastics are not in the water and not in the, the drink that we eat. Yeah, but God's... They go and that's the man. Feminine. That's why men are now feminized. And women are... <laughs> well, what, I, what I'm saying is that uh, men's testosterone levels are the highest right after they wake up yeah. every morning. Mm -hmm. yeah. I guess that, I, I don't know. Oh, I'm just, uh, I'll you, Google uh, that.
I've got one A man over here. I don't know, I don't know if anybody well, else. Like I said, it's been because, it's because they've been dreaming about it all night long. <laughs> could be that. Could, could be that too. I don't know. And that's okay. I'm not saying that's wrong. Okay. Uh, we're not going to get through even with lesson nine. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not making the progress I wanted to make. And I didn't even want to do it. What are you talking about? The lesson, I said we could skip it. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 is next. Oh, my. Oh, my. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 is next. Ooh, I like this. <laughs> Verses 12 through 20. All right. All things are lawful unto me, Paul said, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any of those things. I'm not going to let any of those lawful things rule me. Verse 13, meats for the belly and the belly for meats. But God shall destroy both the meat and the belly. Now, the body is not for fornication, but the body is for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. That word fornication is comes from the Greek porno. Uh, I think it has something to do with California. Uh, verse 14. Verse 14 says, God hath both raised up the Lord and will also raise up us by his own power. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ, like David did on a rooftop, and make them the members of an harlot? Uh, Bathsheba wasn't really a harlot. She was just a neighbor's wife. God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? See, that's when the marriage happened, when uh, David and Bathsheba. Bathsheba. <laughs> For two, saith he, shall be one flesh, but he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. And I don't really, I don't really mean to get uh, anything started here, but it doesn't say that if you're joined to the Lord, you're one soul. See, well, it's just one spirit. Flee, California. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have from God? And, you, you, and you're not your own? That's a question. For ye are bought with a price, Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Both your body and your spirit is God's. Any questions about what Paul wrote to the Corinthians? Then let's go to James chapter 1. Did, did you have a question, Alana? Yeah, so it's pornography because you, you're not joining yourself with a woman, so is that, you know, 
is that the, the being with a woman, that, that is not your wife, adultery, and then watching pornography, which one is, you're not uh, messing up with any woman. You're, it's not, you're, so you're not sinning with your body, you're sinning with your mind, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. But your mind and your soul yes. are lusting. That's what he but said. But your mind and your soul are lusting after that female. Yeah, but you did not commit the actual joining with the. So I don't know. I but you did in your mind. Yeah, in your mind. Well. So God, well, well. In, 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 in Matthew, Jesus says, even though that you looked upon her, you've already committed adultery. Yeah. yeah so but, but, Jesus but. raised the stakes of what the commandment says. So he brought the, 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 he didn't lower, he didn't lower the commandment. He raised the commandment. So even if we think and we lust upon it, you've committed fornication. But what we just read in First Corinthians, Paul said, "Everything is lawful for me. I can I can do any of those things. I'm just not going to let them rule. I'm not going to let any one of them rule me, uh, except." the rule to be here at 9 o'clock on Sunday mornings and stay till 10 o'clock. <laughs> right. Or close 10 to... 10.05 or 10.10. Yeah, yeah, but... Okay, here we are, James. We just got a couple more little uh, verses, five verses left. James chapter 1, um, verses 13, 14, and 15 says, Let no man say when he is tempted... Let him not say that I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Now, what I, the, the word I'd like to emphasize in verse 14 is the second word in that verse. It's every man. We're, we're built that way. Verse 15. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Unless you repent and get... Um, you know, forgiveness. I think that every man in 14 doesn't mean every man, it means every man that is drawn away of his own lust. Yeah. Not every, every man does that, but every man when he does it of his own lust. Yeah, well, every man I think does that, but that, that's maybe, maybe you're different. Uh, the last uh, two verses. Then, then, then you have to say that every man brings forth death, then too. Yeah. Because that's the end of the conclusion is a death. So. With all that. Yeah, but I'm, I think he means more, I think that's more figurative. Okay. But I mean. Uh, John chapter 2. We've got two more verses there. First, first John chapter 2, sorry. Uh, verses 15 and 16. And it says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, including the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. Now, those few verses that John wrote uh, seem to imply that... Uh, God's kind of sorry that he that he created the world. I think the world there is very figurative too. I think that means the evil part of the world. Well, yeah, we are the evil part. Ever, uh, yeah, uh, we came out of the evil part into 
uh, into sanctification. Uh, when we study First John, he makes a David. correlation he between the world. David to punish David, so yeah. it's like God is using building evil. Yeah, he punished David. That's right. That's he, like, he, he killed that baby. Was evil, but he said he will use evil to punish us. Uh, I'm sorry that I ran five minutes over, so I'm sorry. And, and, and uh, I'm going to take up where I left off and do the next lesson next week, one week behind, and see if we can catch up into the next one. I, don't know. I can't figure out why they shortened your time and lengthened the service to get to the service. You know, uh, all I can say to that is that I have a boss, and uh, that boss has has made it clear to me what I'm supposed to do, and uh, and I didn't do it today. I'm I'm guilty. Uh, slap my hand, or put handcuffs on me, and you know, <laughs> yeah, or get somebody else to teach the class. I you know I don't know. Oh, no. Well, why are you doing this? You, you want somebody else teaching the class? <laughs> They're going to put you in shackles. Yeah. Uh, just, just let me teach a class with, in shackles with, you know, with a chain. Any other comments? I'm getting so uh, out of control now that we just need to conclude. But if anybody has any other thoughts, I'm willing to listen. Then let's pray. Lord, we are indeed again and again and again thankful for this place to which we can come with our friends, gather with our friends on Sunday morning and read your word and talk about it and praise you, learn of you. And we've come here not only to learn of you, but to worship you. And we're going to do that in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, who indeed is our Savior. Amen. God bless you all for being in his house today.